the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He 
thank you so much, Sindhabas and Evangelical Bible Church Choir. And um, thank you so much, Marcel, for putting that together and for the she honorary. Who, who is the man behind the camera? You will seeing him, but thank you, Marcel, and Keon for such a wonderful re rendition. Um, as you know, St. Augustine Evangelical Choir has always sung at Keswick conventions. So they're like a, a standard staple with us. Um, at this time, I would like to just invite Pastor Shad Smith to come and continue the blessing that you get in the new life as to give us a little deeper meaning into the blessings we have in the, with the new life in Christ. Pastor Shad Smith. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It is my joy and privilege again to be with you here in the Zoom room. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, you can. Very, very good. I, I appreciate so much the good music tonight and what a blessing the blessing was to us. And uh, Pastor uh, Reverend Lincoln, it's a pleasure to see you here uh, this evening as well. I've looked forward again to this meeting and uh, 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 smiled a little bit when they talked about this is our second day uh, of the Keswick meeting. Uh, it seems now like it's, uh, it's been at least a month, and, uh, but uh, I commend all of you in Trinidad and Tobago for uh, going this uh, extra mile to have the conference virtually this year, and it is indeed a blessing to be a part of it. Well, I'll get right into the message this evening. I'll invite you to turn with me again to that marvelous eighth chapter of the book of Romans, the book of Romans. And as you are turning there uh, this evening, I would like to begin by recalling your attention to a few things that we talked about in our last message, the freedom of forgiveness. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1, Paul was talking about the justifying work of salvation when he said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And what that opening statement of Romans chapter 1 means is that for the child of God, you and I have been set free from the penalty of sin. We don't have to worry ourselves about being on the road to hell. And not only has our sin been paid for at the cross, but the righteousness of Christ has been imputed onto our account. And now you and I that are saved are justified in the sight of Almighty God. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But now that you and I that have been saved, those of us who have been justified and set free, uh, now that we are in Christ, we need to understand that we were set free not to live the life that you and I choose to live, but we have been set free now to live the life that God chooses to live in us and through us. I'm free today because of Jesus and what he did for me at the cross, but I am not free to do what I please. I am free, however, to do what he pleases. I'm free to have the righteousness of God put on display in my life for the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, the apostle Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so those who are in Christ, we have a new life that has been birthed by the Spirit of God. And this new life now comes with a new behavior in which the righteousness of God can now be manifested uh, through us as we walk according to the Spirit of God. And so that kind of brings us through the first two verses of Romans chapter 8, and we will pick up our reading this evening in verse number 3 and begin reading about this new life that God now begins to sanctify and conform to the image of his dear son, the Lord Jesus. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse number 3. Listen to Paul, the apostle. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, or on account of sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness, the righteous requirement, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Would you bow your heads with me just for a moment as we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the inerrant, infallible, uh, in uh, inspired word of God that you have given to us, you have preserved, you have allowed us to have a copy in our hands tonight. And we thank you, Lord, that the foundation of scripture is sure and steadfast. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for every person uh, that is gathered representing several different countries and churches and families tonight. And Lord, we desire to know the abundant life that you promised in the gospel of John. Lord, we desire not only, uh, Lord, to uh, know you, but to know you deeper and to know you better. And Heavenly Father, we pray, God, as we open the word of God tonight, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Lord, that he would help us. Lord, that he would shine the light onto the word of God. And Lord, help us to have understanding. And Lord, in the end of the message, help us tonight not to be just hearers of the word alone, but doers of the word help us to make application. And now, oh God, I pray, Lord, that you would help me. I understand tonight that I must decrease and you must increase. Father, may they see less of me and more of you in your word tonight. And Lord, may all that is said and done be uh, accomplishing something tonight for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. This evening we are considering the new life that is birthed by the Spirit of God. This new life is a life where the righteousness of God is now manifested. The life uh, that we uh, possess now is not only different than the life that we had before we were saved, but it is a life that is completely impossible apart from being saved. Tonight, as we look at Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, and consider this new life, I want us to think back for just a moment and consider what the Apostle Paul shows us to be the prohibition of righteousness. The prohibition of righteousness. Listen again to the first part of verse number 3. Paul said, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. I would first like for us to consider two questions as we look at that first part of verse number three. The first question is this, what is it that the law could not do? Well, uh, you need to understand that the law could not see to it that the very righteousness it demanded should be fulfilled in us. In other words, the law could not produce righteousness in us. Uh, the law could only reveal sin. The law could only condemn sin. Uh, let me give you an illustration. If you saw a sign that said, no trespassing, and uh, you saw that sign, you read that sign, it was very clearly posted and marked. That sign, however, could not keep you off of another man's property. It could simply or merely show you that you were guilty once you stepped on the other man's property. And thus the law itself cannot produce the right kind of behavior that God is looking for in your life and mine now that we know Christ. The law itself cannot produce righteousness. Amen. There's a second question that Paul answers in this part of verse 3. The question here, why cannot? The law produce righteousness. So what's the problem here? And he gives the answer in verse 3. Because the law is weak through the flesh. All that this law of God has to work with is a sinful, corrupted, unregenerate flesh. Which, by the way, at its very best, 
my flesh and your flesh can produce nothing better than what the prophet Isaiah called filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, the prophet said, we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as a filthy rag. We do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. You need to understand that the old flesh gets in the way of righteousness because this flesh is bent in the opposite direction from the things of God. Uh, in Psalm 51 and verse 5, the psalmist put it like this. He said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. To be shaped in iniquity is to be inclined or bent away from the things of God. You need to understand tonight, if you're listening to me and you are still lost without Christ, there is absolutely no possibility for you uh, to ever have any righteousness produced in your life because the very flesh you inhabit prohibits righteousness. And even if you are saved, I'd like to uh, invite you to just take a good look at yourself right now. Uh, look at those hands and reach down and feel those hands and look down at your feet. Uh, your hands and your feet, your body is still made of flesh, the very same flesh that you and I were born with. And as long as you and I are living in this flesh, as long as we would yield to the flesh, there can be no manifestation of righteousness in the, in the life of the believer. Paul said in, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8, he said, he that soweth to the flesh, he that soweth to his flesh shall reap corruption. Uh, this sinful corrupted flesh is prohibited from producing anything good. And that's why Paul said in Romans 7 and verse 18, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. The only thing you and I discover in our flesh is this. This old flesh is corrupt, and because of its corruption, it is prohibited from producing righteousness. Look with me now at verse number three. If we have been called now as believers to uh, follow after Christ and walk in his ways, uh, we have to somehow... Uh, uh, manage to find this righteousness. And you and I, of course, uh, are given the answer to this in verse number three again, if you will look at it. Paul is now going to show us a word about the procurement of righteousness. Let me read verse three again, but this time I'll start at the beginning and read all the way down through the verse. Paul said, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, there is the prohibition of righteousness. Listen to the rest of the verse. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. When you and I were still lost in our sins and on our way to hell, we needed not one but two things to take place in our life. First of all, needed to be set free from condemnation. We needed to have the penalty of sin paid for and lifted uh, from us. You and I needed to be uh, uh, taken off the road that was leading us to a devil's hell. And God did that for us when he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, when God condemned my sin and your sin in the flesh of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. There on the cross, Jesus, the one who never committed a sin, the one who had never done anything wrong, he who knew no sin became sin itself. And when Christ, the, uh, the, the perfect, darling, precious Son of God, became sin for us, God the Father punished out my sin and your sin in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that took care of the first thing, the condemnation of sin. That got me off the road to hell. Thank God for that. But I told you we needed two things to take place in our life. 
Not only did we need to be taken off the road to hell, but you and I needed to be placed on the road to heaven. And the scriptures tell us in the book of Hebrews, without holiness, no man shall see God. So we needed the condemnation to be taken out of the way, and that was taken care of at the cross. But we also, number two, needed the righteousness of God. And if I read to you the rest of what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, you will see that Jesus accomplished both of these things for us at Calvary. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 21 again. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Paul was basically telling the church at Corinth the same thing he was writing to the Romans in these two verses. He was saying what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did for us by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemning sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, you and I already know now that the law could not produce righteousness. There was the prohibition of righteousness. Why? Because it was weak through the flesh. But the righteousness of God has now been procured. It has been obtained for us at the cross. You see, the law could neither justify me, nor could it produce righteousness within me. But now God has done in the person of Christ at the cross, he has justified me. And because of the work of the Spirit of God in me, that work of sanctification, God has made the manifestation of his righteousness a possibility in my life. And beloved, I would say to you tonight, if you were to see me and you were to walk by me and you were to live among me and you were to spend time around me, Anything good that you would see in my life today would not be a product of this flesh. It would be a product of the righteousness of God himself. It would be the goodness of Jesus. And so that brings me now to the third and final point. And this is what we're talking about. We're going to talk about this new life that is birthed by the spirit of God. As we come now to the end of verse four, we consider the third thing. And I call this the portrayal of righteousness. We've considered the prohibition of righteousness, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. We have considered the procuring of righteousness, what God did for us when he sent his own son and Christ condemned sin, our sin in his flesh on the cross. But now we get to the, to, to the brass tacks of it all. We get to the place that we desire to be at here in this second of the five Keswick messages. How is the righteousness that God expects portrayed in our life? Well, we take the whole now, uh, the, the completeness of verses three and four. We see the law could not produce righteousness because the flesh was weak. We see God has sent his son to procure righteousness. In other words, God has made the righteousness of Jesus Christ available to us as a part of our salvation. And now the righteousness of Jesus can be portrayed in us, in our life, for the glory of God as we walk after the spirit of God. This is the new life that we are talking about the new life that is birthed by the Spirit of God. This is the life that you and I have been given, that life in which Christ has put his righteousness down on the inside. His glory dwells within us. Jesus said to his Father, the glory that you have given me, Father, I have given them. I think about our Lord as he went up onto the Mount of Transfiguration and took there with him Peter and James and John. And the Bible says he was transfigured before them. Never before had they seen their Lord in such a way. But that word transfigured is the word metamorphosis, where we get our word metamorphosis. It means all that inner beauty, all that glory on the inside in one 
resplendent moment burst forth onto the outside and they saw the glory of Jesus. And beloved, I would suggest to you today that the Christian life is nothing less and nothing more than getting the glory that is on the inside out to the outside where the world can see it and glorify God. Notice in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. You may underline those two words, in us. In us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You need to understand the righteousness now that we are talking about in the Christian life is not a righteousness that is portrayed by us. It is a righteousness uh, that is portrayed not by us, but it is a righteousness that is portrayed in us. You see, when you got saved, the sweet Holy Spirit came to live within your heart. In verse number nine, we learn from the lips of the apostle that you and I, after being saved, we are not waiting on the Holy Spirit to arrive in our life. In fact, Paul said, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so, beloved, I want you to know the moment that you got saved, Jesus Christ, by his spirit, came to sit down in the heart of your living room, and he has taken up residence within you, and he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The law of God is written in your heart, and the Holy Spirit of God says to us now, just let go, just turn your life over to me, and I will live the Christian life in you, and I will live it through you. And beloved, I want you to know there is only one man that has ever walked on planet earth that has ever lived the Christian life. He is the God man. He is the man God, Jesus Christ. He's the only one who could ever say uh, to those listening to him, who is he that convinceth me of sin? I, I wouldn't dare say that uh, to, to anybody in a public uh, setting, I, I, especially if my wife was in the room, I, I couldn't say, uh, just point out one sin in my life. Oh, we wouldn't have time for the, for the testimonies of people to say he has more than one sin. We don't have time to talk of all of his sin. Yet Jesus Christ can make that uh, incredible claim that he knew no sin. He had never committed a sin. And therefore he has uh, been able to live the perfect life. He is the only one to live the Christian life and the only possibility of the Christian life being lived in your life and in my life is if Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit lives that Christian life in you and fulfills the law of God in your life. I cannot tell you how many people that I have talked to about giving their life and trusting by faith for the Lord Jesus to forgive them of their sins and come into their heart and change their life. I can't tell you how many people I've shared the gospel message with and I've asked them, would you like to know Christ in a personal way? Would you give your life to Christ? Would you be saved? Only to hear them say, I can't do it right now, but I will one day. And I'll ask him, what's the holdup? What are you waiting on? In an effort not to be hypocritical, they'll say something like, well, I'm not going to give my life to Christ right now. I'm going to wait until I can live it first. And beloved, I would say to any lost person listening, if you are waiting until you can live the Christian life, until you receive the Christian life and eternal life, you're like the man that says, I know I'm sick but I'll go to the doctor when I get a little bit better. Beloved, I want you to know tonight, there is no power in this flesh to live the Christian life. The power to live it comes with it. It is the power of Christ himself. Jesus comes and he lives in you and he lives the Christian life for you. You say, well, how does he does do that, preacher? Look at the last part of verse four. This is how the righteousness of God is portrayed in the life of the believer. We're going to get very simple, very practical. Verse 4, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Here it is, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, is the sanctified Christian life in a nutshell. The Christian life is walking in the spirit and after the spirit of God. It's the same thing that Paul said in Galatians 5 and verse 16. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the way you walk in the spirit is just day by day. Day by day, you spend time with God. You spend time with the Lord in his word and in prayer. And you yield yourself to his leading. And as he prompts you throughout the day, you yield yourself to his direction. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how God sanctifies you and me and conforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. This new life that we're talking about, this life that is birthed by the Spirit of God. Let me tell you what it is not. It is not you and I doing our very best to keep a long list of rules. That's not it at all. Ladies and gentlemen, that is legalism. And legalism always ends up uh, at a dead-end street with a person traveling that road ending in failure because the law cannot live the Christian life. It's impossible. This flesh makes the law weak to live the Christian life. So what then is the Christian life? The Christian life is God living his life in you. It's God living in you and through you. You can't keep the rules. But guess what? Jesus can. And he has. And he's on record. He has done that. In Philippians 2, verse 13, Paul said, It is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Dear Christian, I want you to know tonight, Jesus Christ not only gave himself for you, he also gives himself to you. He not only gave himself for you, but he gave himself to you. And now he desires to live the Christian life in you. Yeah. Many years ago, Major Ian Thomas struggled with uh, the abundant life. He, he struggled to attain the abundant life, to experience the abundant life. And he said the moment his life started becoming all that God had hoped for it to be and desired for it to be. The minute he began living his life uh, to the maximum, to the maximum, not to the minimum, not, uh, not just getting in entry level, but the, the deeper life, the moment he began to experience that is when he began to pray these words. Listen to Major Thomas's prayer. Lord Jesus, I can't do this but you never said that I could. And dear Lord Jesus, I know that you can do this. And you always said that you would. I can't do it, Lord, but you never said that I could. You can do it, Lord. And you always said that you would. Maybe I'm talking to a precious mother tonight. You're trying with every ounce of strength in you to raise those precious kids. You're frustrated. You've tried. You say, I can't do it. I can't do it. Maybe I'm talking to a dear Christian tonight and you're still struggling with some addiction. And you've longed for purity in your life. But the harder you try, the more you fail. Perhaps I'm talking to someone tonight and you're faced with a difficulty of forgiving someone who has hurt you and done you wrong. Or you're faced with the tremendous difficulty of loving somebody. It's just not easy to love. And you say, Pastor, I know what I need to do and I've tried to do it, but I just can't seem to make it happen. Oh, listen, it's not impossible. It's not impossible when you walk in the spirit. In fact, dear friend, that is the only way it is possible. You've got to come to that place in your life 
where you say, sweet Holy Spirit, I want you to lead me today. I have yielded myself to you. I want you to show me the way. I want you to guide me. And I want you to live the life of Jesus in me and through me. In me and through me. And as he does that, he will conform your life into the image of the very son of God. He will sanctify your life. Many, many years ago, there was a gospel song written. And the words go like this. Jesus, be Jesus in me. No longer me, but thee. Resurrection power, fill me this hour. Jesus, be Jesus in me. Would you pray like that tonight? Would you pray and just say, Lord Jesus, just be Jesus in me. I can't do this, Lord. My flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came and my sin was condemned in your flesh. And Lord, now you have come to reside in me. And Lord, you have come not only giving yourself for me, but giving yourself to me that you might live in me and through me. Oh, God, have your way now in our lives. Jesus, just be Jesus in me and if that is your prayer tonight anything good that is said about you anything noble anything pure all glory goes to god because it because it is him and not you it is his life they see and not your life and that's the way god wants it to be And all of God's people said, amen. May the Lord bless you.